The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University is honored to be a supporter of Indian Country Today. Working with award-winning professors, Cronkite students learn news reporting, social media, shooting and editing videos, and producing content for communications industries. Cronkite's 15 professional programs give students the opportunity to cover critical issues throughout the U.S. and beyond. Learn more at cronkite.asu.edu. is Indian Country Today. Esquili, yes, eh. Thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Tholohungva. Here are the headlines from Indian Country Today. The housing market is booming this year, and it could affect the HUD-184 Native Home Buying Program. The Department of Housing and Urban Development offers the 184 program to first-time home buyers and those refinancing who are Native Americans. The home loan program has almost hit its $1 billion budget. Between October of last year and April, 3,000 new cases were filed. HUD is warning tribes as the program reaches its limit, the refinancing option could be phased out. HUD says it will give as much notice as possible if suspensions are needed. Updates will be posted on the website hud.gov backslash section 184 and anyone can watch for the latest information. The Native American Rights Fund and the American Civil Liberties Union are challenging two new Montana voting laws. The groups say the laws affect American Indian participation in the state's electoral process. The first law ends same-day registration, which tribal citizens have relied upon to cast their votes in Montana since 2005. The second blocks organized ballot collection on rural reservations, the most isolated voter locations in the state. The distance to travel and register and vote limited mail routes and poverty isolate Native Americans from the political process. Jacqueline DeLeon is the lead attorney for this case and was involved in last year's Montana voting rights litigation. DeLeon says these new laws do not help the state's Native American voters. So these laws are designed to disenfranchise Native Americans, make it harder for Native Americans to vote. Um, the truth is, is that uh, the state of Montana is the first state, uh, as far as we can tell in the nation, to pull back election day registration. Along with Native American-led organizations, the Blackfeet Nation, Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes, and the Fort Belknap Indian community and the Northern Cheyenne tribe are also participating in the suit. A First Nation in Saskatchewan, Canada is closing the chapter on its 25-year-old legal battle over land that was stolen in 1905. The Mosquito Grizzly Bears head Lean Man First Nation reached an agreement with the Canadian government. The settlement is worth $141 million plus interest. The Specific Claims Tribunal has received 131 claims since 2011, the majority of which are in British Columbia, Alberta and Saskatchewan. The $141 million in compensation to the community is the largest sum the tribunal has awarded. The Mosquito Grizzly Bears head Lean Man First Nation plans to put the money into an independently managed trust. It will be used to provide a steady source of income for housing, education, and elder and youth initiatives. And by the way, the Mosquito Grizzly Bears head Lean Man First Nation is the longest name of any tribal nation in Canada. And the Helsic Nation in Canada is moving forward with plans to purchase Shearwater Marine Limited. The marine is near Bella Bella on British Columbia's central coast. The First Nations signed a letter of intent to use some of the funds from an agreement with the federal government. Shearwater Company has been a spot for tourism, and it comes with a large restaurant and bar, plus coastal wilderness tours and a famous sport fishing business. The tribe anticipates the purchase will go through by the end of June. After more than a century, the Seneca Nation in New York is getting a piece of its history back. The Buffalo History Museum has returned the official Red Jacket Peace Medal to the original owners. This medal was given to Seneca diplomat Red Jacket by George Washington during negotiations for the Treaty of Canandaigua. The Seneca Nation President Matthew B. Pagels said, this medal represents what lives inside each and every Seneca, the heart of a sovereign people and our rightful recognition as such. The tribe plans to display the medal at the Onosa Gwende Cultural Center. 
After being closed due to the pandemic for the past year, the National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, D.C. is reopening this Friday. To make sure every visit is a safe one, they have put new safety protocols in place. There will now be a limit each day to the number of people who can visit the museum. All visitors to the National Museum, no matter your age, must have a free timed entry pass to enter the museum. And every time, every times are every 30 minutes and passes are only valid for the date and time they are issued. All visitors will have to go through a security check. The museum does not offer lockers, coat or bag check. And there's no word on when the museum's center in New York City will reopen. And those are the headlines from Indian Country Today. I'm Patty Thelahungva. Up next, a film takes on the Indian Child Welfare Act. And native news from Washington, D.C. The Indian Child Welfare Act became law in 1978 with a goal of keeping Native American children with their families and tribes. As Brooke Pepion Swanee found out, the law was overlooked when Kendra was adopted by the Melanchuk family. Brooke's first feature-length documentary, Daughter of a Lost Bird, premieres at the prestigious Human Rights Watch Festival in New York and everywhere online. Welcome, Brooke. Thanks for having me. So set the stage for us with this film. Yeah, so, um, you know, we decided to make a film uh, about uh, a, a, a person uh, kind of giving us an entry point into this larger national and I would even say international issue about Native kids being taken from their communities and raised in non-Native homes. Um, so we followed Kendra Malnachek Potter, who is our protagonist through the film, and she you know, serves as an entry point, but, you know, really, you know, helps guide us through um, her experience of meeting her birth mother, who it turns out was also adopted. Um, and April Kowalski, uh, she, she grew up also in a non-Native family. And so they both were able to kind of share that, um, that reuniting process with their indigenous relatives. And then towards the end of the film, you know, there's no spoiler alerts that I have to give here. They return to their Lummi homelands and um, meet and connect with family and um, relatives there. So yeah, that's, I mean, that's the, kind of the film in the nuts in a nutshell, but it's, it's really about identity and, um, and reclaiming that identity. Great, let's take a look at a short clip. As native people. Kids were pulled out of their homes. The families not even knowing where their children were. When I was adopted, my mom says, the agency had said to her, be careful. If someone like saw her and was like, that's a native baby, <laughs> you're white, you shouldn't have her. She was terrified someone was gonna try to take me. Hi, April, this is Kendra, your birth daughter. You were there when Kendra was reunited with her birth mother. Please tell us about that. Uh, so the day that I was there, I, I actually flew in that day and we went straight from the airport to meet her birth mother. And it was just me and Kendra and um, April had a witness. And so it was the four of us there as they were meeting. Um, and generally, you know, with film, you often will have, or documentary, you might have a few more people on set who are helping you, but it was just me with this, um, you know, small DSLR uh, camera and then a Zoom recorder attached with like lots of weird cables. Um, and, and just being able to kind of witness that moment with them um, was really profound and, and amazing. And we spent about four, four or five hours in that park that afternoon. Well, and I know you've worked on this film for a long time, but one of the things that really strikes me is how the narrative about the Indian Child Welfare Act has been, um, let's say, twisted by the media. And this is the part of the story that's almost been forgotten, yet it's the most powerful of reuniting tribal people with their community. 
Absolutely. And it's the primary driver of the film for, you know, for me, you know, as an indigenous person with um, family who have been involved in some way with the Indian Child Welfare Act um, throughout my lifetime. I mean, I'm not, you know, adopted or anything, but, um, but, you know, watching like how my extended family have had to deal with it or how, you know, they, um, they themselves you know, adopt other children to like keep them within uh, a tribal community. Um, I, I just wanted to, to kind of honor that effort. You know, people, people don't understand how important it is to keep native kids with their families. And there's a lot of times, you know, thinking about baby Veronica, for example, where it's about people talk about race being the reason, well, they don't look indigenous so therefore they're not indigenous but but that's not the case they're they are as valid of a tribal member depending on you know the customs of the tribe that they come from and and they shouldn't be you know removed you know this gets into issues of sovereignty issues of citizenship um to our tribal nations that um need need to be honored you know, and I probably shouldn't say this, but I will anyway. Right now, there's a great debate about what uh, a former senator said on CNN, but there's not been a debate about CNN's reporting on the Indian Child Welfare Act and people that you think of like Anderson Cooper, who are really hostile to the legislation. I think I think part of it is just ignorance. They don't understand, you know, why the legislation is in place. They don't understand the grassroots grassroots movement of indigenous people who have, you know, pushed to have the legislation to keep kids with, you know, native families. And look, you know, we know that it oftentimes like kids will not necessarily stay with their, you know, within their extended family, within their immediate family. Um, or within their tribe, but the point of the act is to keep the kids tied in some way to their tribal community. And that's what I think is uh, so amazing about what the Lummi Grandparents Committee are doing at Lummi Nation. You know, they're really advocates for keeping Lummi kids connected, you know, culturally in some way, wh whichever family they end up in. And it's also a way of them kind of like monitoring and seeing, are these kids placed in a good family? Do we feel good about that? And are we able to kind of, you know, raise this kid, you know, through community and through, you know, other non-native communities together? And I feel like that's like such an indigenous concept and that oftentimes that gets overlooked um, in the ideas of like the Western ideas of like the child kind of being like property. Films are so um, such personal encounters. How did you think the film will change the families involved? Um, well, I really hope that it um, strengthens, you know, ties for everybody in the family. You know, the 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 idea is about healing. You know, to heal whatever wounds or um, rifts that have been created by like the lack of connection. Um, but I think it's not just like the indigenous family, but also like the non-native family members that they might have a greater understanding about how, you know, they can also um, learn and connect with their indigenous relatives. This has been a project for, as I mentioned, for a long time. How has it changed you? Uh, well, I was very naive going into this project. I thought, oh, this, you know, this will be, we'll just find her family and it'll be great. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's more complicated than, than that. And for me, it's um, been a real honor to witness a family coming back together and to see them growing and to see, you know, like the grappling specifically that Kendra has with her indigenous identity and, you know, learning a lot of stuff. What I really hope, you know, for everybody moving forward is that, you know, it's not indigenous people aren't just about, you know, serious issues all the time either. You know, we're, we're full, full human beings. We have lots of emotions. And um, so I hope that, you know, we can move, move beyond some of the seriousness too. 
And of course, families. I mean, you think about family gatherings, and it's that non-serious side that almost always erupt almost immediately because of the way people interact. Right. Particularly. Right. What's the most important thing you want people to know about the documentary? I guess one of the most important things that I want people to know is that April and Kendra's stories aren't unique. They're um, at one point for you know a couple of generations, there were one out of three or one out of four, depending on you know which statistic you're looking at, native kids who were removed from their families. That's a huge portion of our indigenous population in this country. And um, by no means are their stories um, specific to everybody, <laughs> but it certainly is um, something that we need to remember. Well, tell me about how people can see this and the kind of the distribution uh, that we'll have for the film. Absolutely. So, um, you know, with independent film, oftentimes you take the film out to festivals. So um, our U.S. premiere will be at the New York Human Rights Watch Film Festival. You can actually watch the film right now through their platform. Um, you can give them a donation or um, if you're not able to, there's ways of, you know, paying zero dollars if that's not in your pocketbook. Um, the, and then we're going to be doing a Q&A on May 26th at 8 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, uh, 7 o'clock Central, 6 o'clock Mountain, 5 o'clock Pacific, um, with moder moderated by um, Dr. Adrian Keen and Matika Wilbur from the podcast All My Relations, along with um, Terry Cross, who is the founding executive director of uh, the National Indian Child Welfare Association. So we really hope that you're able to join us in that conversation um, because, you know, I still have a lot to learn about, you know, this topic. And then beyond the closing night, um, you know, on the May 26th, uh, we're, we'll probably be in a couple more festivals throughout the country. Um, and it may or may not be geo-blocked to the region, depending on the festival. Uh, but we are currently, you know, in talks with um, PBS about a broadcast at a later date, if you do miss our online, or maybe hopefully, since we're all getting vaccinated, um, we can meet and, you know, be at a festival in person. That's, that's exciting. Um, and I guess congratulations, because one of the festivals, Toronto Hot Docs, has already given you an award for the film. Well, I, we didn't receive an award, but uh, participating in Hot Docs in and of itself is, was, uh, is such a prestigious um, documentary film festival. And that was our North American premiere um, earlier this month. And, and we were, were so grateful for them for that opportunity. I, I think... Um... What stories are left to tell about Indian Child Welfare Act? I mean, you've just barely touched it with this one family. What's left on the agenda? Well, I think, um, you know, there I, there's a continued battle in the courts. Like that, you know, that absolutely is still a, a story that can be told um, in depth. Uh, there's still, you know, a lot uh, about the foster care system that is problematic and, you know, needs a, you know, in-depth investigation and examination um, regarding, you know, how Indian or, you know, Indigenous kids get put into the system. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stories still to explore. Well, we look forward to seeing this one. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's nice to be here, Mark. Thank you, Brooke. The Daughter of a Lost Bird is at the closing night for the Human Rights Watch Film Festival, and we'll have links on our site. We'll be right back with our weekly check-in, this time with Holly cook Macaro. Holly Cook Macaro joins us now. She's a partner at Spirit Rock Consulting. She's worked for Tribal Nations for more than 20 years, and she's a regular guest commentator on our program. Welcome, Holly. Thank you, Mark. Good afternoon. So uh, let's start with Florida. Um, what are the, what's the outline of this deal that's changing the nature of gaming? Well, the um, all eyes are on Florida this week. If you look at social media um, and 
uh, a lot of the information that's coming out in terms of the gaming deal um, and sports betting, the Seminole Tribe is about to be the big winner in the third largest state in the country. So they will uh, have control of sports betting. They will have authorized three new casinos in Hollywood, Florida. They will um, also not just be in control of sports betting for themselves, but for the state. They will be the ones who will um, be the operator for sports betting in the state, at least that's my understanding, and um, all for a cost of $500 million a year at, at, at a minimum to the state. So it's a multi, and that deal will be locked in for 30 years. That is the deal that was passed by the Senate, the state Senate yesterday, uh, 38 to one, terrific support coming out of there. Uh, it, I don't think it will have quite that, that lopsided number in the, in the House there in the Senate today, but it is expected to pass and Governor DeSantis negotiated that deal. So it is expected to go through. That won't be the end of the story. There is expected litigation as well, but this is a tremendous victory for the Seminole tribe of Florida. And I really think a bellwether for uh, how, what tribes need to do in looking to both protect our brick and mortar, keep an eye on the expansion of gaming, which is something tribal leaders have long just really, I think, stood firm on, but also with, um, with this expansion of gaming in so many states, mobile gaming, sports betting, as we've seen over the last year, it is really something that tribal leadership is going to be looking to. And deals like this, deals like New York, which are wide, wildly different, deals like Arizona, those give all the folks who don't have tribal interests um, in mind uh, ideas about how to approach those states like California, which is really you know, the golden nugget in terms of mobile gaming and sports betting. You know, Holly, um, you mentioned three states, New York, Florida, and Arizona. And I was a reporter in 1988 when the uh, Gaming Regulatory Act passed Congress. And um, I remember then it being entirely a federal issue. And now the landscape has changed. It's the deals and the negotiations are at state capitals rather than Washington. What does that mean for gaming in general, for tribal gaming? I, I think it reflects a... Uh a necessary shift. There are some tribes who have long been active in their state capitals, but because of our uh, federal federal tribal relationship, the foundations of tribal sovereignty, that's long been where we have gone. But you're right. Um, after the passage of the Wire Act, really, this has driven the tribal leadership and their efforts towards the state level necessarily. And uh, that that evolution, I think, is again just part of the part of the evolution of tribal politics. The the influence that is now there on the federal side, and now we see it in effect and effectively more and more effectively in some states than others uh, in play. And so I think that will play out in a number of different ways. You mentioned. Um, oh, let me shift, shift topics. There was a um, hearing on Capitol Hill for confirmation. Uh, maybe tell us about that. It, yes, it. Um, for all the political junkies out there who love to watch these things, uh, Bob Anderson, who is an enrolled member of the Boy Sport Band of Ojibwe in Northern Minnesota, uh, he was his confirmation hearing, he's been nominated to be the solicitor for the Department of Interior, which is the top lawyer. He's not just doing Indian Affairs, uh, which he did in a previous administration, but he is the top lawyer, akin to what Hillary Tompkins, um, a member of the Navajo Nation was during the Obama administration. So again, an extraordinary appointment um, at the department and widely supported in Indian country. Most folks and legal scholars know um, the, the bright star that Bob Anderson is and has been. Uh, his hear he did very well at his hearing yesterday. Uh, I was, his, his, the, he had a couple of questions on McGirt from Lankford. Uh, I thought he really handled a question from Senator Mike Lee regarding the exclusion of tribal lands from the oil and gas leasing exemption quite well. And uh, it was fun to see because uh, Mike Lee has a long reputation for holding up nearly every tribal bill in the Senate for some reason or another. You've always got to get by Mike Lee, but 
Bob Anderson, I thought really schooled him on, on the politics of Indian lands and the, and the differing jurisdiction and authority that the Department of Interior has versus state lands. A theme we've kind of hit several times when you've been on the show is about just the influence in really significant posts. And this would be one, of course. I understand there's also some new ones that we should uh, talk about. Yes, there is uh, very relevant right now, but uh, Fatima Abbas, who has been at NCAI and one of the lead staffers in both monitoring, advocating for, and um, helping with the implementation, getting, getting information out to tribes. She is uh, moving over to the Department of Treasury. So she's left NCAI, or she will be at the end of the week. And this is a new move for Treasury. She is going to help set up and implement the, the, the funds that are coming out of the American Rescue Plan. That's a huge deal. You, you know, this is the 20 billion plus another, I think 10, 12 billion more that, will be, that they will be administering. So for the first time, we are going to have uh, Native American staffers in place at the Department of Treasury. And uh, I'm hopeful that her, her time there and her clear, her clear expertise on this, uh, it's going to make it a much smoother path this time around. We always learn a lot. Thank you, Holly Cook. Wakaro. Yes, thank you, Mark. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. Join us again tomorrow and online at IndianCountryToday.com. Thank you for watching. I'm Mark Trahan. Sometimes you got to take a stand just because you know you can. Oh, you got to run, you got to run. This is Indian Country Today.